And it happens with poetry because poetry is kind of a combination of music and story. It's the ultimate beautiful human creation. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudoua, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Chief Marketing Officer. Our goal is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. So, Andrew, this week we are talking about poetry. Why? Well, because we just need a little break from writing. So poetry is fun. It is light. You know, when I was growing up, my father read out loud to me in huge quantities, Mother Goose. And all those poems, I could recite them. And But they're so silly. They are very (laughs) silly. But I still enjoy them very much. And, of course... Now that I have grandchildren, I read those poems to my grandchildren because I also read those poems to my sons Mm. as they were growing up. And it becomes a a cultural thing that is such a joy to pass on. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate. We we just are happy to know where this idea of the cow jumped over the moon came from. (laughs) But if we hadn't had nursery rhymes as children, Mother Goose and our repertoire of experience, right. that would make no sense at all. Well, It still makes no sense, but it would even make m- more no sense. Cultural, Culturally literate. You need to know Mother Goose to be culturally literate, right? Yeah, I think a few people have said that. And to win baby shower games. Oh, uh, so, no, that's uh, not an experience I've had. Well, no, I don't suppose so. But I have actually, you know, I, I did a baby shower for a friend of mine, and I created a game. And no, listener, I don't have that game anywhere, but I'm sure you could make it up. And I I started the nursery rhyme, Mother Goose, and they had to fill in the blank with the missing phrase. I was shocked to find out how many. I picked easy ones, Andrew. I was shocked how many didn't know how to finish the poem. So there you go. Well, there's there's kind of a sadness there. And I I look at part of our mission Mm -hmm. as inspiring people to continue the transmission of the beautiful traditions, heritage Mm -hmm. of language that we have and not just kind of give up on it and turn everything over to YouTube and Twitter and um, accidental language. There's an intentionality in learning nursery rhymes, in reading Mother Goose, in memorizing, and as children get older, more beautiful forms of language, Mm -hmm. then we will come into contact with, Mm -hmm. you know, on the daily basis of work and commerce and home life and all that. Right. uh, Insert plug for your talk, Nurturing Competent Communicators, and the importance of filling your mind and soul with good language. So You always have to insert those plugs. Well, it's, it's a great talk. And you know what? That one we give away for free. Yeah. So link in the show notes for Andrew's Nurturing Competent Communicators talk. So I guess we should then, you know, talk about the idea of just appreciating poetry mm-hmm. and what that does right. for us. Right. And and just, listener, just so you can kind of follow along the pathway that Andrew and I are taking today is uh, appreciating poetry. And you have stories about you growing up, too, with your dad reading poetry to you. Yeah. And sharing poetry. Got some stories about that. And then creating poetry. So there we go. So appreciating poetry. Yeah. So children love to laugh. Mm -hmm. Children love to wonder. Uh, When they can laugh and wonder at the same time, it's even better. And they don't have to understand everything to get delight in the experience. Mm -hmm. So you think about some of the genius poets who wrote things that 
are just intrinsically delightful, wonderful, and humorous, mm -hmm. kind of all wrapped up. And that's kind of like the introduction, I think, for many of us. It certainly was for me, into that whole world of playing with words. Mm -hmm. um, I I remember my father used to read poems um, at night when we were on our boat, and we'd sail over to Catalina Island on our little sailboat, and there was no TV or radio or anything. There was nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a cabin-in-the-woods experience mm -hmm. type of thing. And he would read poems from this book, and I've mentioned it before, Poems Old and New, I think, is the title. Mm -hmm. And we can link to it, edited by Ferris. Mm -hmm. But there were sections, and there was a whole section of humorous poems. And that was, of course, you know, for my sister and me, that was our favorite. And he would read these poems kind of week after week. And so there was that anticipation of hearing that poem mm. that would tickle you. Yep. Uh, or flat out just cause hysterical laughter. <laughs> and I, I, do you remember being young and laughing so hard? It was almost intoxicating. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, it was almost like that, that overwhelming rush of whatever neurotransmitters, endorphins <laughs> or dopamine, I don't mm -hmm. know. But that, that almost irrepressible laughter was something that, you know, I craved mm -hmm. as a young child. Mm -hmm. I remember in particular one poem that was in this collection of poems, favorite poems, old and new, in the humor section. Mm -hmm. And my father would read this thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's called Ella Telephony by Laura Elizabeth Richards. So I'll just say it. Okay, great. Um, once there was an elephant who tried to use the telephant. No, no, I mean an elephone who tried to use the telephone. Dear me, I am not certain quite that even now I've got it right. However it was, he got his trunk entangled in the telephunk. The more he tried to get it free, the louder buzz, the telephy. I fear I better drop the song of elephop and telephop. <laughs> Okay, so that poem, for some reason, even though I had heard it a hundred times, mm -hmm. I would, again, hearing it a hundred and first time or whatever, I, I would just fall into this convulsive laughter hmm. that was almost like a drug. <laughs> and, of course, I'm very disappointed because I have tried this poem on my children and grandchildren and most of them have never even seen a telephone with a cord that mm -hmm. could get tangled up. Right. So we need a different version of it, you know, something <laughs> about a, I know, a penguin and a cell phone. But, right. but it was that word play. It was that making up of words that don't exist or the scrambling of words or the, the confusion. I think children can relate to confusion in language <laughs> sure. because so much of what they hear is not clear to them. Mm -hmm. But when it's obviously intentionally confused, mm -hmm. it's it, it's freeing. It's a mm -hmm. delight. Uh, you know, Jabberwocky, Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves, Did Gyre and Gimble in the Wabe. Uh, you know, right. how did he think of that stuff? Right, right. And so there's a freedom that comes when you see people playing with words that I think is just a, a natural um, balm to the soul for children. So I always loved the funny poems, you know, the gingham dog and the calico cat and uh, the Duke of Plaza Toro, you know, the silly things. Like, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And we laugh, we smile. Uh, so I think that's a step into the appreciation of poetry right. Right. for for all of us. Right. And if it happens at a young age, then you pretty much have a person who's going to say, yeah, I love poetry. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, and I've met adults who say, I never really liked poetry at all. Mm 
and I just think, how sad. How did that happen? What was, what was missing from your childhood? I also point out in the, uh, you know, in the nurturing competent communicators talk, that if you want to have children learn poetry, like memorize it, um, you need to start with the right kind of poems, right? The ones that are humorous or tell a story or are maybe a little bit, um, you know, violent or disgusting or uh, less than all beautiful, you know, mountains and flowers. Yeah, I'm thinking of Jack Perlutsky and that poem about the kid who wouldn't take out the trash. Mm -hmm. Right, and it piles up in the kitchen and it rolls out into the street. And he continues to refuse to take out the trash. And pretty much, you know, eventually the whole world is filled with trash because he's so lazy. You know, it's ridiculous. It's not a pleasant image, but it it moves into that zone. And and what I have found is that the good poets, like Prelutsky, like you know this woman Richards, like Lewis Carroll, um, uh, Edward Lear. And the um, the limericks, right? Mm -hmm. right? If you catch the child's imagination with the silliness, the beauty of the language mm -hmm. comes along with that, and then they start to fall in love with the sound mm -hmm. and the rhythm and the rhyme schemes and the the less crude, not in a, a way of it being inappropriate mm -hmm. imagery. So they can then learn to appreciate the subtler, more beautiful imagery. And so they move from that appreciating the thing because it's funny or amusing or engaging to appreciating because it has intrinsic beauty. And that's the doorway to things like Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. So you also talked about wonder. I love that word. I think of, um, I think of Robert Louis Stevenson's The Land of Counterpain. Mm. And... You know, just even, what's a counterpane? Well, it's a bedspread. Now you know. <laughs> but he's, you know, the little boy sitting on his bed playing with the soldiers because he's sick. And you just, that wonder of imagining with him the the rivers and lakes and oceans and soldiers marching over the hills. So, And there's so much poetry. You know, there's just millions of poems. Mm -hmm. And a good anthology I would say it would be on the top three most important books you could have in a home mm -hmm. uh, because a good anthology will have poems that connect with people in different stages of life. Mm -hmm. So Ella Telephony made six-year-old me, you know, bliss out on ridiculous humor. Mm -hmm. But in that same book are, are poems that I have appreciated later in life. Um, one of my favorites is Longfellow's The Children's Hour. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how the children assault him in his chair. He's in his castle. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't really get a delight out of that poem in a younger age. But as an older parent or grandparent, mm -hmm. I just could read that poem again and again and again. And so a good anthology, I think, is just the most valuable thing you can have uh, for your whole life, mm -hmm. from when you are before you're a parent to when you have kids to when you have teenagers to when you are old mm -hmm. and have children, great-grandchildren. You know, mm -hmm. there's going to be something for everyone. Yes. I know that you used, used um, the, Children's Book of, the Children's Book of Virtue with William Bennett. Yeah, which has both stories and mm -hmm. poems. Yeah, and uh, I'm actually reading through that now with my granddaughter. Oh, fun. But she keeps saying when I visit her again, which I will be doing so next week, um, she'll, she, keeps wa she keeps wanting me to start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I go, do you want to pick up where we left off? No, I want you to start at the beginning. So mm -hmm. she wants to hear those same stories and poems. <laughs> yeah, I have, I, I th I've come to this understanding of children and repetition I almost think I can make a whole conference talk out of this idea. But why do children want to hear the same story again and again? Why do we like to hear music that we already know? 
it's because it creates an anticipation. And then the fulfillment of that anticipation is an experience of joy. And so you have a, a simple little children's book, and if it's beautifully written, the language has a flow. And so they are getting a little more out of it each time. They're starting to uh, get it better definitions of the words. They're starting to build the images better. And the repetition allows for that intellectual comprehension to grow every time. But there's also that point at the end, right, um, where Ping decides to go home into the boat, even though he's getting a little spank on his back because he was the last bird in the boat. There's that moment of fulfillment. The children know the ending. Right. And yet they're looking forward to the complete fulfillment of the anticipated end. That's why I suggest that when parents play music for children, they less is more. Take a, a, a great piece of music that's maybe just a few minutes of an excerpt, right? And play that you know, several times a day for many days in a row. And what happens is by the end of a week or so, the child loves that piece of music way more than he or she did the first couple times it was heard. Why? Because they know what's coming, and so you're looking forward to it. And then some some of those pieces of music are so well-known and so well-appreciated because they build the anticipation so effectively that everyone recognizes it. Mm -hmm. And that happens, I think, with stories, and it happens with poetry because poetry is kind of a combination of music and story. Right. It, it's the ultimate beautiful human creation right. that can be appreciated through the ears. Yeah, good. So appreciation. I I understand we you have a Oh piece yeah, of paper. so it was funny. <laughs> you um had told me we were going to record yes. a podcast. I said what are we going to talk about? You said poetry. Mm -hmm. And that very afternoon, mm -hmm. uh I received uh this message. And uh so it's very sweet. Dear IEW, I am a homeschooling mom with four children, two, four, seven, and ten. Wow, hands full. We have been using your poetry unit for several years, and I have marveled at how young children can memorize poetry. The first year, we used it with our then six-year-old. Her sister, just three at the time, had been listening and was able to recite all 19 poems without much extra work. Wow, that's great. This year, though, I am particularly grateful for the levels of poetry included— my 10-year-old daughter is working through level 3, the 7-year-old daughter level 2, and my 4 and 2 are going through level 1. Since we're all working on it together, my youngest can recite parts of O oh Captain, My Captain Aww. and A Psalm of Life, uh, Longfellow, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and regularly does throughout the day. He can also recite all the poems we've learned from Level 1 and helps his sister when she's stuck on a word in Level 2. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's not to say he has a remarkable capacity, rather that the opportunity created with this program in use with varying ages is, quite simply, astounding. My young children are exposed to beautiful language and cadence, and the older ones are learning and retaining poetry that I hope will stay with them in their hearts and minds. Thank you for creating and offering this wonderful resource that will be a treasure in our family for many, many years. Wow. Gratefully, Rachel. Rachel. So, Rachel, as you might have already heard, I carried those Mother Goose poems through adulthood. And Andrew can recite a lot of those poems that his father read to him growing up. So I am sure that will happen. And, of course, the book, that the resource that she's talking about is our linguistic development through, through poetry, poetry. memorization. Yeah, which is still, in a way, my favorite thing mm -hmm. that we've ever done. Yeah. Um, for that reason. And, you know, she articulated, I think, very beautifully that, you know, the, how did she say, the beautiful language and cadence, mm -hmm. right? And that's what helps it stay in their hearts and minds. Right. Then once you own something, once right. you have something, there is a desire to share it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I notice this with young children and jokes, right? Right. As soon as I tell a joke, or maybe a few times, mm -hmm. then there is a compelling desire for that child to tell that joke to someone else. Right. Actually, I think it's true for almost all of us, yes. right? I mean, yes. if we hear something that's a good joke or something interesting, we appreciate it, but then we, we find someone who we love or respect or mm -hmm. uh, anyone we can grab, mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> right. we share that with them. So this discipline of memorizing poetry mm -hmm. not only creates, I think, a lifelong appreciation, um, even a respect for the poems and the poets, but it's an opportunity to share the joy. Mm -hmm. I had uh, an experience many years ago. Um, this this was only a few years after I had done the, the first edition okay. of the poetry program. Mm -hmm. So it didn't have kind of the widespread traction that it does now. And this woman had driven five hours to come to a teaching, writing, structure, and style seminar. Wow. And I was chatting with her. And I said, oh, you didn't have to drive five hours. You could have got the video. And mm -hmm. I always feel guilty if, you know, I make people go out of their way. And she said, oh, no, I already watched the video. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. She goes, I actually just wanted to share something with you. Mm. And I thought, well, you could have called me. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. The story she wanted to share was with her 10-year-old son who uh, she said was – halfway through level three of the poetry program, mm. which, if done correctly, would mean that he had memorized approximately 50 poems. Right. And could recite all 50 of those poems on demand. Mm -hmm. That's the way our system is, right? Right. You memorize and you then recite, retain, and never forget. Suzuki method of poetry. Yeah. And and so I'm like, well, that's fantastic. I'm glad. And then she said, but what I really wanted to tell you is his favorite privilege. Mm. The thing that he would choose to do, if he could do anything he would want to, is to go to the retirement home or assisted care facility, you know, where there's old folks, mm -hmm. and recite poetry. And I almost cried on the spot mm -hmm. because I thought, Wow. I, I could remember being a kid, and I could also imagine being really old mm -hmm. and thinking about what a beautiful thing. Right. Uh, such a, a satisfaction on both ends of the spectrum of life. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when I made the poetry program, um, I was partly motivated because I didn't want to pay royalties for anything. <laughs> so I used only old poems mm -hmm. that were in the public domain. Right. But, you know, most of the old good ones are partly still good because they're still old. Right. Uh, yet I thought, well, the the people, you know, in the retirement home, those are the poems that they learned mm -hmm. when they were children. Ah, uh, yeah. And then more recently, I've spent some time in one of these places because of aging mm -hmm. uh, parents-in-law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I realized... Uh, most of the entertainment is pretty awful. Mm. So, you know, a 10-year-old boy coming in and, you know, reciting, you know, a poem or two or three or 10 or 50. From memory. From memory mm -hmm. would just be a delight. So, so I think that when we have that opportunity to share what we have appreciated there's a greater fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And that's true. You know, if you if you play music it's one thing to practice. It's another thing to listen to. Mm -hmm. But playing for someone who can appreciate it is the, the fulfillment, the completion of that joy. Right, right. Now, as you're, as you're talking, you're talking about a lot of poems that have a certain rhythm or rhyme scheme. I, that's not all the poetry that's out there. Oh, no, no, it isn't. Poetry that does have a rhyme scheme is easier to memorize. Mm -hmm. So you want to start with that. But yeah, there are any number of poems that are more free form mm -hmm. that are also powerful in their imagery. The fog comes in on little cat feet mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yep, yep. It doesn't have that same 
musical rhythmic quality, but it has more of a more of a tonal harmony mm-hmm. to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think you you want to start with something that draws you in powerfully, and then you can expand out into other uh, areas. And that's true. Whether it's music, you start with the most beautiful music, and then you can learn to appreciate things that are maybe different, a little dissonant, or different than what you're used to. Uh, That's true with art, right? If you look at beautiful art, then you start to understand it, and then you can start to appreciate people who, who move out from kind of that center of what you're used to. Um, and then that kind of leads us to the third idea, which is creating. Right. Right. Creating art. Um, you know, I noticed a long time ago when teaching music, the children who had the repertoire down, who had every piece memorized and maintained and had been playing their memorized repertoire for years, were the ones who were most likely to get excited about improvisation. Oh, okay. Because, you know, there are ways to teach improvisation. Mm -hmm. And it was the kids who had the the greatest, you know, kind of database of memorized music Mm -hmm. that could experience the joy of quality improvisation the most easily. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think this is true with language as well. Mm -hmm. The more language you have memorized, the more patterns you have accessible to create something new Mm -hmm. and unique. Mm -hmm. And the more vocabulary you have, the easier it will be to find words that rhyme. Mm -hmm. True. Uh, So we're, we're really, in a way, by appreciating, memorizing, practicing, and maintaining a life inside the world of existing poetry or literature or music or art or whatever, the more we will be prompted by our spirit to express new combinations and permutations of those notes or of those words or of those colors and shapes. Right. And this, I think, gets to the core of our desire, you know, of human beings to create. And one of the things that I always thought was kind of interestingly obvious, but not something that people immediately think of when they see the words, recreation. Mm -hmm. You're a recreation major. What do you think of recreation? It's all about let's have fun, let's play games, let's go hiking. But if you examine the word recreation, Mm -hmm. that's really where we get some of the greatest satisfaction exactly. is we take the tools we have, we take the elements, we take the pieces, and we put them together in a new way mm-hmm. that we haven't seen before and maybe in a way that nobody has seen before. And human creativity is the ultimate form of recreation yes because we are recreating mm. with the stuff that we've been given yep yep i used to say to my sons as they were growing up we'll probably start saying this to my grandchildren hard work is immensely satisfying that idea of when you worked on something you can be very proud of it and if you worked hard on something you can be satisfied that you've done a good job and every time you engage in that mm-hmm you have an opportunity to learn from what you did before, Mm -hmm. to add in new information, and do it just a little bit better, whether it's Legos or coloring sheets or improvising a piece of music on the piano or writing a new poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So writing poetry. You yourself have engaged in that a little bit. We've, We've enjoyed... In a previous podcast, your poem on the fox. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I I have to kind of be forced into that. Mm-hmm. I don't wake up in the morning and say, gee, I really want to write a poem today. Right, right. Um, but it, it is one of those things where when the time, the space, the demand have been carved out mm-hmm. and I, I give up my resistance, my belief that it's not going to be good, mm-hmm. 
I do kind of get into it. Yes, and I, you know, we currently don't have a poetry writing course in our catalog. We have in the past, but I, I love what you talked about at the beginning, this idea of play and delight. And if and when we ever create a course on writing po- poetry, that needs to be at the forefront. It's something that's delightful. Something. You look like you have a plan I, for us to create a poetry course. I usually do have a plan for something <laughs> up my sleeve. Well, we won't uh, divulge too much about no, that we, until we have much to divulge. It's true. It's very true. Well, thank you, Andrew. This has been a delight talking with you about something that we both enjoy. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, please subscribe to our podcast in iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or Spotify. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcasts. Here you can also find show notes and relevant links from today's broadcast. One last thing. Would you mind going to iTunes to rate and review our podcast? This really helps other smart, caring listeners like you find us. Thanks so much.